This is the story of Jairi Lero, who wished to become a hero because he thought that being hero was all about the shining holy sword in hand, along with slaughtering demons, defeating the demon lord and marrying a kingdom's princess, after which what awaited him was becoming the king and living a happy life. He used to admire these stories and tried to be like that, but now after he saw the reality behind it, he gave up on these fairy tales which were more tragic for him. One day a girl named Reddy came to his house and suddenly asked him to join his party, while he had no idea whatsoever of what was happening. He looked at this girl inviting him with shining bright eyes, and he clearly didn't want to bother himself in that life of being in an adventurer's party. He stood still for a few seconds and shut the door on the girl saying he was doing just fine. But Reddy didn't want to give up for some reason so she kept knocking his door so hard that he had to open the door or it would have been broken. He asked her frustratingly what she wanted from him, and if the reason was not worth banging his door for then he warned her that he would report Reddy to the knights. She told him that she wasn't here to sell something or recruit him into any religious organization, and if she didn't have those reasons, he asked her just what the hell she was disturbing him for. Reddy saw this as her chance to introduce herself, and she broke his door in the process. She told him that the door would be reimbursed, but for now, she wanted to put out her suggestion again to him that he should join her party which would be awesome as she was the attack hero. So, she assured he would have a good life with cute girls around him. She thought he would say yes for these benefits, but when he heard she was the attack hero, he recalled it meant that she was the hero of this generation. Jairi knew that in this world, only those people get to become the hero who gets chosen by a holy sword, which then blesses them with a holy mark. So the attack hero Retinoa Innocent, also known as Reddy, was chosen by a holy sword named Grand Virgu. Although in their current generation, the number of heroes had increased so much that it reached the double digits. And Jairi heard recently there had been another new hero chosen with black hairs. He stated that having black hairs was unusual in this continent so people had been mistaking him for the hero which was pretty annoying considering he wasn't all that interested to be involved in anything. It was clear from just his eyes, but Reddy didn't seem to be caring about that. He sighed and asked Reddy why she came here to invite someone like him to her party and to show her that he wasn't worth it. He took out his adventurer's card to tell her that she was with the wrong person. The card mentioned that he was just a D-rank adventurer and after seeing that card, she made it clear that she got the right person. He got confused by her action and tried thinking of how to get rid of her, while Reddy asked him if he still hadn't remembered her. She tried changing her hairstyle a little bit to the one she might have had when she met him before, and asked him if he recognized her now, and Jairi actually remembered her after seeing her hair. It was about five years ago when he used to excessively overhunt the great wild bears, and she agreed he got that part right along with the time when he came to save her from a great bear's attack. But then something hit him from the past memory about the time when he used to be a bit weird. Whereas Reddy stated she had admired him since that time, and the only thing she wanted in her life after that was to become a hero. She still remembered the parting words he left her with, to the precision that she performed his dramatic dialogues with him telling her not to cry but to use it as a fuel to become a hero who doesn't cry. And if she became a hero then she won't be weak enough to cry in any situation, which would also help her to achieve her dreams. She also reminded him how he used to wish to become a hero himself, for which Jairi had always been training for many years. Jairi told her to just stop acting like he used to because he considered those weird dialogues as one of the dark parts about his past. Jairi exclaimed at her while crying, and requested Reddy to forget about it this instant. She asked him why she needed to forget those great words which had been nothing but inspiring to her. After that, Reddy said that she was extremely happy when she finally saw him at the town. She thought it was fate which brought her to him again. She recognized his face and those cloudy eyes he had almost immediately. He didn't expect someone to look so observantly at him. He asked her why she was inviting him to her party even though she was a hero now and didn't need help from anyone anymore, especially not from a D-rank adventurer. Reddy was clear in her mind and she came out clear to him that being in a party with him had been her goal all along. He felt good after hearing that from her, and then she asked him what his answer was to her invitation. She heard him and went silent which made him think this was over. Then she smiled and claimed that she hadn't heard him before. He got frustrated from the looks of it, because he knew for sure that she heard him. Jairi told her again that he wasn't going to join her, but Reddy said she didn't hear him because she didn't want to hear no from her. They kept at it for a while with her not wanting to give up on making him join her, and finally by the evening, he agreed to join her party. She got excited after hearing that, whereas Jairi was disgusted by it. Jairi told her that he would join her party for a while, and she suggested making that temporary period to only 50 years. He asked her if she knew what even a little while meant. 
He told her that it would be fine if she wanted to make a little while until their first great achievement, to which she thought and replied in that case, they would be together until the demon lord was defeated by them and the world would be saved. She welcomed him in the party with that. While he didn't expect she would make something like that, their first achievement with a D-rank like him in the party, but he could see that she was dead serious and also very happy to have him in the party. He asked her what their party would be called, and Rate told him that she thought of the name Black-Haired Hero for their party, which she derived from the black color of Jairi's black hair. Then Jairi said he liked the name and he would later on leave an application form at the guild. After that, he asked Reddy to come another day. She agreed to him and left for her place making sure to let him know that she would come later on. They waved byes to each other and once she went out of sight, Jairi took a breath of relief as he stated that it was his time now to dip the party proposal now that she wasn't here. He ran away from the place he was staying, because it was that serious of a problem for him to join a party. Not only that, but to fight a demon lord for a D-rank like him was just plain stupid. He did want to become a hero in the past, and in order to become one, he drank a lot of horrible tasting potions to increase his magic power, kept polishing his magic and skills all the time in a day except for sleeping hours which were less as well. He often found himself on an adventure which brought him close to death so many times that he got used to that feeling eventually, and so he proceeded to kill many demons without any fears. After doing so much of hard work, he waited for the holy mark to appear somewhere on his body, because a mark appearing was necessary to become a hero. Jairi waited and waited for that to happen so that his long-awaited wish would be fulfilled, and he would become a hero. Jairi was excited to become a hero but he didn't actually admire them for the adventures. He just wanted to accomplish becoming a king and live a happy peaceful life. He always wanted peace in his life, so the life of a king was appealing to him, which lead him to train so hard that he would come closer to achieve the strength to defeat the demon lord, then get crowned as long and enjoy a happy life where everything would happen automatically by someone else, and he would have a person for everything so that Jairi won't even need to do the hassle of moving around to do anything for himself. Then one day, he overheard three people talking at the table near him about how the heroes made it really hard for themselves to be able to have any time for themselves. Their talks caught his attention, as they continued to mention that for heroes, every day was just about having to subjugate demons without any proper rest, just so that common people would be able to live in peace right now. One of those guys said he wanted to become a hero as well, but then he heard that once a hero becomes a king of their place, they don't actually get free time for themselves, as they are still busy, so nothing ever really changes for them, after which they laughed it off by saying not just anyone could become a hero, especially not among them since they were just drinking booze and fooling around with chicks. But their conversation deeply affected Jairi, as he felt a shock to hear all of that. It made him think that all the time, and efforts he spent until now were all for nothing if he was going to have to work just as much all the time even if he would have become a hero. It was that day when he made a decision, to earn enough to live and spend his time leisurely without working much as long as the situation didn't call for it. And so back to the present, he woke in the morning and started walking around the town hero's vile. He figured that he would just walk around as there was no chance Reddy would be able to spot him in these many people but he noticed that there were quite many more people around than usual. He wondered if there was some event or something going on. Then someone came running and mistakenly stumped him. He didn't feel anything from being stumped like that, and the girl in the hood politely apologized to him for her mistake. He stated it was fine and he should be the one to apologize for being careless while walking. Jairi noticed the white hairs of the girl which were unusual on this continent, but the same went for his black hairs so he didn't really care all that much about it. The girl said sorry and quickly started running again as if someone was behind her. Jairi then saw something fall on the ground, and taking a closer look, it turned out to be a pendant. He tried thinking of how to return this pendant to the girl, but not thinking much about it, he decided to just drop it off at the night office after he was done with his shopping. Later on, when he stopped by the night's office, he heard the noises of the people around the streets nearby who were announcing to each other that the princess Raphine had been spotted in a nearby area. Hearing that reminded Jairi that this was the day of the month when the fourth princess of this country was allowed to walk around the town. But to be honest, he didn't care. Even seeing the princess didn't concern him because his comfort was much more precious to him than even the princess. He just got on his bed without even trying and slept normally just like any other day. And after one month of living like that, he didn't have enough money left in his pocket which was quite an issue for him. He figured it would be tough to pay for living and food this way, and to fix this problem, Jairi had no option but to go and accept a request from the guild. And when he went there, he found a quest which seemed to be good enough for him. 
The quest was an escort request to escort the client to the neighboring kingdom of Edel. Jairi thought that the carriage should take them around five days to reach Edel, so it was okay with him. Also, he thought that once the request would be completed, he could just chill in Edel instead of coming back right away. However, he was a little curious about why the client wasn't named in the quest, but the rank of it was irrelevant with the rewards being extraordinarily high. He thought about it a little while registering himself from the quest at the guild. After that, when he reached the site of the quest, he saw the carriage with other adventurers around which were all those who participated in this quest. But then he noticed a familiar face among them, and to confirm, he took a closer look. It turned out to be Reddy, the attack hero whom he had been trying to sneak away from. She noticed him soon enough which made her happy to see that he was here. Reddy stated it had been a while since they met each other, and she thought that Jairi might have missed out on filling the application at the guild, so she got one for him and carried it with her for the whole month while trying to find him. She requested him to sign the application, whereas his expression was clearly showing the unhappiness he was feeling after seeing her. He asked Reddy about why she was here of all places, and this situation made him feel like he won't be able to get even enough time to spend his life leisurely. And after seeing this many things happening to him, he understood that even a lazy life was not easy to achieve. She called it fate that they also happened to have some business related to Edel, so she and her party took this escorting quest. She asked him to join her party again and gave him his application form. He told her it wasn't fate at all and declined from joining the party. Then Reddy's party members called her out and asked if this person was the Jairi she was talking about. Reddy agreed and told them that Jairi was absurdly strong, whereas Jairi noticed that these two others seemed to be working with Reddy even before this request. After that, the other girl got closer to him to see if he was really strong, but didn't think he would be. Her saying that he didn't seem strong made Reddy pout and she told them that even if he had cloudy eyes, no presence or aura, and was really lazy, he was at least strong enough to make up for all of that. Jairi asked her if she was making fun of him, then ignoring his question, others asked Jairi what his name was. Reddy was shocked to suddenly have realized that up until now, she hadn't even asked him for his name while she should be the one to know it first. Then Jairi introduced himself to them and didn't fail to mention that he was just a D-rank adventurer, with his speciality being the hobby of sleeping a lot. Then Reddy also introduced herself properly once again, as Retinoa Innocent, the attack hero and she liked sweets but hated vegetables. The other girls' names were Eve Dulkies and Lena Terman. Lena's rank was a, and she stated that she was kind of mage along with being Reddy's party member right now. Jairi figured she was somewhat strong, and then he was going to ask her about something related to being an Eterman, but stopped midway. Lena asked him what he was going to ask, but he said never mind and it was nothing much to be talked about. They got confused since he just stopped in the middle without completing it, whereas inside his mind, he was thinking of a person he beat it up before in the past with the same name, Red Hairs, and Elf Ears. He knew that the Eterman family was full of hot-blooded assassins, and figured that if even Lena was an assassin, then it might turn out to be painfully annoying for him. He decided to do his best for now to stay clear of her in any way. Then Reddy suggested that they should hold a majority vote to decide whether her master Jairi should enter the party or not. Jairi didn't like being called a master, so he asked her to quit. Then Lena mentioned her point of view that she didn't really mind him joining at all, and Eve said she didn't care either way. Reddy took their replies as agreement of him joining, and said out loud the majority wanted him to join. He told her not to just go and decide things on her own like that, and besides even if even said she doesn't care either way, might also mean she didn't want him to join. Reddy stated that Eve did want him to join and pushed her ahead to show him her agreeing face, which was actually expressionless. Reddy started asking Eve to decide if she wanted him to join, while Jairi tried talking her out of not letting him join by asking her if she really wanted a D-rank person with cloudy eyes in her party. Then Reddy spoke out loud that it was fine with her either way, and walked away from between them. Reddy told him to not mind Eve's behavior as she was always like that, after which Jairi looked around to observe the surroundings. He mentioned that their client doesn't seem to have appeared here yet, then a guy came forward to greet Reddy. He claimed it had been a while since they met and introduced himself as Kane, a B-rank adventurer. Kane said it was truly for him to have met the hero Reddy in a place like this. He believed it was expected to happen because they were both high in status. Jairi thought that Kane must be Reddy's acquaintance from the way he was talking to Reddy, but noticed that her expressions were saying otherwise, as if she was trying to remember Kane. Then Kane looked at Jairi and stated to Reddy that he was curious about something. He asked her why there was a trash D-rank adventurer present here which made Jairi feel a little off. 
but he didn't care about anything that much, so Jairi mentioned that he just accepted the request like others. Kane said he wasn't talking about that, and stated that he would ask again in simpler terms that a low life like him could understand. Kane exclaimed at Jairi and asked what was a mere D-rank doing here in a request needing a rank C or higher. Jairi replied that it might be hard for him to do his D-rank, but he reminded Kane that rank was irrelevant in this quest. Not only that, Jairi also added that Kane was acting like some sucked-up noble who was here to just grab the leftovers from other adventurers. It made Kane angry and he hated low-rank adventurers for the very reason that they were vile with their tongue. Jairi looked back with serious eyes then Kane took out a pouch of money and threw it in front of Jairi, saying if he wanted money then he could just pick this up and leave. This disrespectful behavior of Kane startled everyone including Reddy and others started chattering about it. Whereas, Jairi was calm about it and he stopped Reddy from taking an action against Kane. The money was still lying on the ground, as Kane mocked Jairi to pick the money and remove himself from this request since a D-rank won't be of any use to them. Kane called Jairi trash for the third time, and this time he went too far. Jairi was angry about it inside but he did his best not to let it show, and he made it clear that he was surely here for money. Reddy wondered what her master was going to do, whereas Jairi admitted that he might be a trash-like person but he stood up for those among the low ranks, who were more knowledgeable about medicinal plants or monster dismantling than anyone else. Some of them were even working to help out the orphanages, and so out of many of the low adventurers he knew. Jairi clearly stood tall while he claimed that they were not trash at all. His tone changed to a heavy voice, and Reddy was impressed by what he said, whereas Kane shuddered at first, but claimed that it didn't matter to him what those who are trash in his eyes got to say. He repeated it to Jairi to pick up money and get out of here. Jairi angrily said he would pick it up since his wallet was empty, and while he was collecting them, he said that Kane needed this money more than him. Kane asked him what he was saying, and claimed that this much change was nothing to him because he was a noble third son of the S.H. Tall's family. Jairi told him that he would need this money as a lad who had no right of inheriting the head position of his family. Jairi called him just some third son of a family and said he could use this money to butter up his attendants. Jairi told Kane that he became a B-rank thanks to his family, not because of his own skills. The expression on Kane's face turned pale after hearing that which proved that Jairi was right about it, and he charged at Jairi with his sword. Jairi was about to use some move to counter the sword attack but suddenly, someone spoke up to calm down. Her voice stopped Kane's sword, and the girl commanded them not to let out a single word and lay his sword down. The voice belonged to a new girl who seemed to have some kind of mysterious voice. Her voice controlled Kane's body and it started moving on its own just like she wanted it to. Jairi understood this mysterious girl was using word magic which was pretty high-level magic which one can't just learn on a whim. She had the same black hair as his, however he noticed that she had changed her appearance through the Ring of Transformation. He wondered just who this girl was while she stood firm and concentrated on some kind of mystery to her. She used her word magic to make Kane explain himself. Kane then exclaimed back at her to quickly remove her word magic control from him, and flaunted his noble position as the third son of the S.H. Dahl's family. The girl sighed and told him that she was the one who put in the request for needing an escort to Edel. So, to put it simply, she was the client and she introduced herself as Fina. She thought that the S.H. Tall's family would have sent a capable adventurer here, but after seeing Kane, she doubts if she misheard them. Kane felt the pressure from her as she told him that this action made her think to rescind the contract with them right now, but thinking of the reputation of the S.H. Tall's family, she made an exception only for this time. She warned Kane if there were to be a next time then she would report his actions to the appropriate person. Fina got done with lecturing Kane and then she stated that Jairi was next to be lectured. Jairi didn't think he had done anything worth being scolded for, and then told Fina that even if Kane was at fault, he was just as guilty because he provoked him when this could have been ended before. So, she claimed to have a lot to lecture him, which was why Fina told him that he would be riding in the same carriage as her. Jairi didn't expect he would get to be treated like this, and Reddy stated her master was surely amazing to be that close to the client this quickly. He told her it was not exactly a good thing since it just meant he would lecture even more for no reason. After that, the fight which got everyone's attention got over and so they departed for Edel. Jairi was with Fina in her carriage feeling nervous about the incoming lecture, but before she could say anything he decided to speak first and introduce himself. He told her that his name was Jairi Lero and confirmed with her if her name was Miss Fina. She told him to drop the miss and then said that she actually had some things to ask of him instead of lecturing. She wanted to ask him if there was anyone among his acquaintances, or in hometown, who had black hair and wore a mask. 
he thought this was surely going to be a lecture, as he replied to her that there wasn't anyone other than him with black hairs in his hometown. She made an upset face as if she expected to know something. He wondered if she was interested in him because he used to have black hair. Then he mentioned hearing that recently there was a hero chosen in Edel who had black hairs, and she exclaimed that was exactly it. She stated that the hero she had been waiting for finally appeared, and for some reason she was sure that this hero was the person she had been looking for all this time. Jairi could see it on her face that she admired this person and really had been wanting to meet him. She believed this person was fated to come in her life, and Jairi saw that she wished to meet this person eagerly. Then Finer realized she had been acting all dreamy and dramatic, so she apologized to him for being like that. Jairi asked her if this request was kind of related to that black-haired hero, to which Fina agreed that was indeed the case and she was yet to be certain if this person was the same person she wanted to meet or not. He understood that the reason behind this request not mentioning a name was because she didn't want to disclose her social standing. She said sorry for that and revealed that Fina was not her real name either. He told her she had nothing to apologize for because as long as she had this person riding the carriage, she was sure to be safe. Fina was amazed to see that he noticed that the person riding the carriage was not normal. He described that this woman was surely a skilled veteran, whom one could only have as escort and be not not worried about anything. But Fina still hired adventurers despite that, which showed how worried she was about her safety. Jairi asked Fina if he was wrong, and she told him that he was precisely correct about everything. She mentioned it wasn't like that she didn't trust him, and being short on words, she stated that she heard he was a D-rank adventurer but the way he talked didn't match the description at all. Jairi said he was just good at observing people, nothing more and more importantly, he asked what kind of person she was exactly looking for. Fina was enchanted to hear him asking that and out of excitement, she got closer to him to tell him about a precious memory of hers which she claimed she didn't like talking about much, but it didn't seem like that to him. She excused that since he also had somewhat black hairs, she would make an exception to tell him about it. Jairi told her that she was too close and should get back, but Fina didn't care about it and started telling him the story from the time when she was six years old. And after three hours of continuously telling him the story, she finished it by saying that this person was the coolest person she met, as he not only saved her like a prince on a horse but also gave her the ring, with a promise to marry her in the future. Whereas, Jairi was exhausted after listening to her story for three hours straight, and she asked him if he was still listening. Jairi said he was listening to every part of it while he was really zoned out for the most part. Then Fina concluded in the end that she had high expectations from this black-haired hero because the person she wanted to meet always used to say that he would become a hero. Jairi thought about the things she said, then her stomach let out a growl to express how hungry she was at the moment. She felt embarrassed and said sorry while explaining that talking too much might have made her hungry. But Fina originally planned on setting up a camp at a later time, so she didn't want to stop here to delay her meeting. Jairi remembered that he might have had some snacks from a while back, so he put his hand in the magic item box and took out a pouch of some snacks. He asked her if she wanted to eat it, but Fina was already shocked to see that he could use spatial magic. She asked him how he was able to do it, because a magic like that required the user to have a huge amount of mana, which was why only specialized porters or high-class magicians were able to acquire this magic. But to see a D-rank adventurer using it was surely not that normal. He answered that he didn't know about any of those conditions to use that magic and just learned it, which made her look at him with empty eyes for a second. He thought she was pitying him, so he just raised the snacks in front of her which got her to be amazed again by the sight of some highly acclaimed chartered snacks which always get immediately sold out whenever they are on sale. He mentioned there was a person who sent them to him regularly for a favor, and even if he told them he didn't like sweets, it couldn't be helped. Fina felt a little envious about it and then he just gave her the snacks. She thought of these snacks so highly that she claimed to treasure these snacks. Jairi told her these were for eating not for saving. Then in the next moment, Fina noticed Reddy looking inside the carriage with a drooling mouth. Jairi asked him just when she showed up, and then offered her some more snacks he had. Reddy quickly accepted them and then Fina decided for everyone to take a break. Reddy ate and liked the snacks a lot, after which, Jairi gave some snacks to everyone else since he got quite much of it in his item box. They enjoyed the snacks and Jairi noticed Kane sitting alone at some distance from others. He asked Kane if he wanted some snacks as well, then Kane told him to shut up in anger. Jairi saw that Kane was sulking about the fight earlier, so he just came and left the snacks on Kane's side. Jairi told him he was free to throw them if he didn't feel like eating but in any case, he left them there. Also, Jairi asked him to let him know how the snacks were after trying them. 
Kane couldn't understand that even if he tried to belittle Jairi, why was Jairi still kind to someone like him as if he had already forgiven him? And so their day one of the escort mission concluded with that. And later in the night, one of the others named Wed came to wake up Jairi because it was about time for them to switch their shifts on watching. Jairi woke up and admitted he kind of got dizzy to remember his shift was in the night. He was just dreaming about how Fina gave him high-class food for listening to her stories. Although, it tired him out so much that he overslept. Then we told him to make sure not to let his guard down even for a bit, because there was someone out there. He didn't tell him straight about it, but to be vague, he told Jairi that he might meet an angel. Jairi wondered what Wed was talking about, as Wed stopped in between. Wed claimed that he was only able to control himself out there in front of an angel because he had a wife at his home he was loyal to. So, in any case, he asked him to be careful and once Jairi went to the spot to keep watch, he understood what Wed was trying to say after he saw Fina sitting out there near the fire. She didn't seem to be getting sleepy, and when Fina noticed him, she greeted him good evening with a smile. Jairi didn't want to be caught up in her storytelling again, but since he couldn't say that straight to her, he asked Fina what was she doing out here. She asked him in return if she couldn't be here was what he was trying to say. Jairi got startled and he told her it wasn't like that, and she giggled after seeing him troubled by that. After that, she saw this as an opportunity to try doing something she never did, like keeping guard at night. Fina mentioned that she doesn't usually get so many chances to go outside like this, so in a way this was a valuable experience for her. She asked him if it would be alright with her, and then he was sure now that Weed was talking about her. He was a bit worried about what they would do if monsters were to appear here, and Fina assured him that she was pretty strong enough to handle that much with a smile brimming with confidence. Jairi got even more worried after seeing she was kind of overconfident, but he stated it would be fine with him in that case. While the reality was that he couldn't say no to her because going along with the whims of a client was also part of one's request, so Jairi thought he couldn't do much about it even if he wanted to. Then he asked Fina if her bodyguard would approve of her being outside like this, to which Fina responded with a fake okay smile, and said she was an understanding guard so it would be fine. Jairi understood that this girl had snuck out here, but not saying much against it. Fina told him that he could leave the night's watch to her, and he should rest as he must be tired after day. Fina talked a lot even if it was this much which showed that she hadn't been around with many friends, or she might not have any in the first place. He told her that he would be worried about her either way, so staying with her was a better bet. Jairi thanked her for the extra help and concern, after which he used his detection magic to check in case if something was around. Soon, he spotted something in the bushes and there was a rock there to check what it was. Then a cute rabbit came out, and he said it would be fine if it was just a rabbit. He told her that being able to see one of these rabbits was rare, whereas Fina was amused to see the rabbit, and for her it was very cute which could be seen in the expression of her eyes. Jairi saw her looking at the rabbit like a child, and asked her if she hadn't seen one before. Fina admitted it was her first time seeing one, and he told her that the meat of this rabbit actually sells for a high price for its tastiness. So, he took out a knife to deal with the rabbit. He asked Fina to look the other way, but her face clearly said she would be traumatized if he cut that cute rabbit. He gave up on that plan and asked her if she wanted to touch the rabbit. Fina asked him if it would be okay, then she came and patted the rabbit. The fluffy head of the rabbit made her feel all happy. Then Jairi noticed the pendant in her neck which was the same pendant he found before. She noticed he was looking at the pendant and informed him that the pendant was her treasure which she held very dear to her. And some time ago she actually dropped it but a kind person brought it back for her. He recalled how he found the pendant again, which made him realize that the girl he met before must have been Fina, although the previous girl used to have white hair which confused him a little. Then Fina said it was important because there was actually a photo of the person she wanted to meet inside the pendant. He asked her if she meant the same person, which again made her start talking about that person. He could see another long backstory coming his way. Then Fina unexpectedly said that sometimes she gets worried if what she kept telling to herself about that person turned out to be false. Or, what if that person was no longer alive? Jairi could see the worry in her face and words, as she claimed that she had waited for nine whole years up until now to meet that person. After a pause, he spoke up that whoever that person was would still be alive and kicking, and might just be waiting for her. He had no way of knowing it but he just believed in it like she had been in those nine years. Fina sensed the pure intentions behind his words, so she thanked him for being kind to her which was unexpected of him. He felt a little awkward from that praise, so he claimed that he was not only kind but also a handsome guy, even if he seemed to be lacking in drive and sleep for most of the time. He would have stayed at home for all his life if possible. 
She giggled at his talk, and then Jidai told her that he believed in doing just enough work to live without any motive or purpose. It was a free life, for a free guy like him with no stress at all. He considered that life the best, and hearing about being so free like that, made her feel like she could do it as well if only she didn't have to mind her status. He listened to her and assured her that only she had to make that decision herself, and it was fine if she cared about it more and elopeded that person she was looking for. She figured Jairi was right about it, and she might find her freedom with that person. She thought of being reckless enough to make it happen. Then he told her to not mind his words, since she had made a promise with that person and had been waiting for nine years. Jairi stated it would be fine for her to be a bit selfish every now, and then, and Fina agreed with him. She said it was kind of mysterious that she ended up talking to him about all sorts of things. Then he told her she was free to confide in him and whatever she would tell him. He would gladly listen to her. He said this statement to make her feel better, but it didn't work the way he wanted as she decided to talk to him more about that person. He was done with listening to her talking about that person, but he did end up listening to her for the whole time until she wished. And after several days since this request started, Jairi faced no actions at all because the other adventurers just took care of all the monsters which left nothing for him to do. He just passed time being chill about everything, and soon enough they were able to see a village out of the woods. They thought of resting there for the night, but once they reached the gates there, Fina found out that there were no guards on the gate. She felt like something was strange about this town, and decided to go and check it out from the inside. Once they reached inside, there was no sight of any life in the town, no villagers at all. It was a scary sight, and then Fina spotted an old granny walking ahead of her. The granny asked them if they were adventurers, and Fina asked her what happened to the people of this town. The granny replied and gave them the shocking news that everyone in this village got kidnapped which left Fina and others on their guard. Even the villagers didn't expect it something like this would happen, and according to the sole villager there, everyone had happened a few days ago when a lot of monsters together with men wearing black masks invaded the village for its food, goods and any other precious metals, after which they even took all of the villagers away. Those invaders seemed to have somehow managed to bypass the gate guards by threatening a merchant, and hid in his cargo carts. After that, they rendered the communication methods of the village useless, so until Jairi and others showed up, there was no way for villagers to do anything about the situation. Oed stated that bandit beast tamers sounded more like the kind of bandits who would do kidnapping only for one reason, slave trading. Jairi knew it was a possibility, and Fina exclaimed that it shouldn't have happened since the slavery was abolished in their content years ago. But after giving it a thought, she caught on to the fact that the slavery was not yet abolished in the other continents around them. Jairi stated that in other continents, especially the parts which were occupied mainly by the beast folks in the Bestia continent, the humans were still oppressed, so in places like those, the humans fetched quite a high price as slaves. He got an idea that the granny they met before was not kidnapped because she couldn't work from those legs, which confirmed his doubts that the purpose of kidnappers was surely slave trading. Jairi asked Fina what she thought of doing under these circumstances now, and she asked him what he meant by that. He told her that they only accepted this request to escort her, and so if there are any changes beyond the request then it was up to her to decide as the client about what should be their course of action. Fina understood what he meant by that, along with the fact that since the village was attacked just a few days ago, there was still a possibility that they might be able to catch up with those kidnappers. She didn't take much time to decide and reached a decision that they would save those villagers without any delay. She couldn't allow herself to just abandon those in need, and everyone else seemed to be in agreement with her decision. Then Wed asked everyone how they would search for those kidnappers, for which Jairi was about to say he got something for that purpose, then Fina thought of using her clairvoyance. But her guard stopped her and said she must not use it. Fina told her to let her use it because there were human lives at stake here. Her guard said there won't be any meaning of her disguise if she ends up using clairvoyance. Jairi heard them and asked if he could use this magic tool he got for searching. Fina and her guard were surprised he got a magic tool for that, and asked where he got something so rare. Jairi answered that he just happened to get his hands on it somehow a while back, and so he used those magic binoculars to look around the area. He quickly found the kidnappers around a cave in the woods, and informed everyone else that kidnappers haven't gone that far from them yet. Fina was glad to hear that and he gave the binoculars to her so that she could take a look at herself. Fina found out through binoculars that the villagers seemed to be fine for now, and they were currently shackled. 
she thought there was still a chance to save them. After which Wed looked in the magic binoculars and saw that the monsters controlled by those kidnappers were all above rank B and about 60 in numbers, which meant that confronting those monsters normally would be difficult because the difference in power was quite much. Fina mentioned that those kidnappers might resort to using the villagers as hostages if anything went wrong in their plans, so the best way to rescue them was to sneak in and free them. Wed suggested they should create a diversion so that their plan goes smoothly. But there was still the problem that keeping dangerous people like them busy for a long time was impossible. Then Lena spoke up that avoiding fighting those kidnappers might make them regret it later on. So they should just crush them here showing that she was surprisingly aggressive to attack. Meanwhile, Jairi was watching them having a conversation and putting different ideas, but to everyone's surprise, he already got one in his mind and asked them why they were even troubled from this situation when they could just attack from the front. Lena and Wed were dumbfounded to hear him say that and asked what he meant. After that, Jairi reminded everyone that they got the attack hero ready with them, so even if they do a frontal assault she would handle it just fine. Wed and Lena were astonished because all this time they didn't even consider Reddy in mind even if she was the solution to their situation. Reddy smiled back at them while she was a bit dumb about the situation. After that, all the adventurers didn't waste any second to launch the attacks on the cave, and the kidnappers were having a hard time fighting them. Lena blocked their escape route from her fire magic while Wed rendered some of them paralyzed. Whereas on the other end, the kidnappers used the monsters to directly attack them, but unfortunately their target was ready. She took a look and slashed them with ease leaving no monster alive in her range. Meanwhile, Jairi was supervising everything from a top angle and just sitting high up on the ceiling of the cave. And the reason he was able to just chill out here with his gravitation magic was that he was assigned to the duty of house sitting. He was happy to be a D-rank adventurer for this reason that nobody expected him to fight with them and he didn't feel like fighting either in the first place. But he noticed that these kidnappers had skull scarves on their faces which kind of bothered Jairi by reminding him of one of the memories from his past. The skull scarf was the same as the ones he fought back years ago. He figured that remembering something from the past was unusual and too tiring. But just to be safe, Jairi decided to use his detection magic again to see if everything was going well on every squad they split into. He was relieved to see they were all good, but when he noticed Kane fighting the monsters, a guy sneaked behind him while he was distracted. The sneaky guy launched an attack at Kane from the back while Jairi was watching over, whereas Kane saw the knife coming but just in the last moment when he had no time to dodge. They were about to kill Kane, and Jairi saw that it couldn't be helped so he must take action at this point. He let out some strings from his fingers and used the spider net magic to tie the skull guy and manipulate his body in a way that the guy killed himself by stabbing his neck. Kane was saved from the guy and he managed to fight off the monster attacking him. Jairi observed from the height that Kane was not an adventurer just in name only. His loves were at least befitting to that of a C-rank adventurer. But Jairi wondered why wasn't he using the body strengthening magic, which was indispensable magic for any swordsman that also supported the sword's skills. If Kane used it then he wouldn't have to struggle that much against these monsters right now. Jairi also saw that he wasn't using presence detection, which could very well be useful just as much. Jairi recalled that he might just not be taught those skills in his school, whereas as for Jairi himself, he learned his skills from straight up binding people up. He understood that the reason behind him knowing so much was that he had taken a straightforward and practical approach to training everything. After that, Lu was about to finish as everyone finished their opponents, and only one more left. Their fight got over faster than they thought, and so it left them proceeding forward to the place where the rescue party went off to. Then after Reddy's group left, Jairi got down from the ceiling and went ahead in the cave. He went to a blank spot and claimed it was where the kidnapped villagers were held, but it was just made to look like a dead end. He sensed it pretty easily and broke it by using his technique. Once that part was done, he decided to quickly get the next tougher part over with before anyone saw him. Whereas, somewhere in the forest, one of the Skull members was running away breathing heavily to escape with his life. He wondered why the attack hero was here of all places, and how did they even get to know about their plans. He was relieved to see that the hidden magic circle was still intact so he could just try it all again in a different location. Suddenly, the Skull member got paralyzed by Jairi's magic and fell down on the ground being unable to move. It turned out that Jairi had been waiting for the mastermind to appear, and then he noticed this Skull member had the subordination bells with him. These were an unusual kind of magical tool which could be used to control many monsters on will. He took control over the monsters, and the Skull Guy asked Jairi just why he was here. Jairi answered that he simply followed the Skull Guy by using a transfer magic circle. 
The guys stated it should have been impossible for him to track them because the skull guy also used concealment magic to hide the magic circle. Jairi told him if he thought that something like that could be hidden from him, he needed to get back to practicing his magic again. The skull guy wondered what was even happening to him because it was not an easy feat to overwhelm an ex or rank like him. But Jairi not only saw through their hiding magic but also their plans to relocate the villagers. Jairi actually thought over how these kidnappers would relocate the captured villagers to another continent. And after thinking about it, the answer was pretty clear that they would use a large-scale transfer magic circle. Jairi even found out that this circle was going to the Bestia continent, after which he touched the circle and broke it just like that. The skull guy was shocked to see how Jiri just broke the circle like that. And then Jairi continued to ask the skull guy if he was the survivor of the skull brigade showing him the scarf of the skull guy he killed in their previous encounter years ago. The skull guy's face turned pale to see that Jairi not only knew about their skull brigade but he even got the scarf of their boss who was killed years ago. He understood that Jairi was the one who killed him and the fear grew deep within his eyes as he asked why did Jairi have that mask. Jairi kept staring at the guy with anger in his eyes, and after realizing that this guy was indeed connected to those he killed, he was a bit bummed to see some survivors were left. She decided to get this over with now that he needed to go back soon. He didn't attack or kill the skull guy, because the paralysis he casted on him was not normal. Jairi warned the skull guy not to move, but the guy already did, and now it was too late for his life, as the paralysis Jairi casted was supposed to spread poison throughout the target's body if they tried to move and kill him in a few minutes. The guy didn't want to die, so he tried calling out to Jairi to stop it and save him. After hearing the word save coming out of that skull guy, Jairi stopped and got back to ask that guy if he would swear to change the ways of his life and turn into night. The skull guy pathetically agreed and swore to him that he would do as Jairi said, and Jairi raised out his hand with a smile. The skull guy thought he was saved, but then Jairi picked his hairs tightly and looked dead straight into his eyes to break down the news to him that he had long ago decided not to trust the likes of him ever again. He asked the skull guy if he even knew what happened to the slaves in the Bestia continent, and explained that the slave humans would be treated so badly there, that they would start regretting even the moment of their birth. And even if they shout out for help, no one would even give a rat's word and they would just submerge into the air and vanish. He asked the guy if it was sad or not in his point of view, after which he left the guy there on the ground claiming that he doesn't deserve any sort of kindness. After that, while Jairi was walking away, the guy took out one subordination bell from somewhere inside his cloak and threw it on the ground to use it to order the monsters around them to go wild and cause a rampage. The skull guy was desperate enough to drag Jairi down with him. But before the monsters could even reach near Jairi, he looked back with a serious look in his eyes. After that, he commanded them to stop and clear open his path without fail. The monsters listened to him as if Jairi was a high figure in the demon world. The skull guy saw the merciless look on Jairi's face as if he was not a human but the demon lord himself. Jairi's commands were concrete words to the monsters as if it had already instilled fears in them. Jairi then took out a cape from his item box and after that, he claimed that darkness was deep enough to be ruled this night as if he was a demon lord. And after some time when he realized what he was doing, he felt extremely embarrassed about it. Wed asked him what was wrong with him, to which Jairi told him that he was fine, and it left Wed confused to see Jairi bring himself as always being lost in his own world. Whereas, Jairi recalled what happened before, from him chasing a survivor of a group of human traffickers, and then following a magic circle, after which he claimed that s different side of him awakened after a while, which was actually the one acting like a demon lord. Jairi claimed to himself that his side was just an abominable illness which he had since his puberty. He tried his best to just forget about it, and as the events were solved, the rescued villagers prepared a banquet for their saviors to celebrate their rescue and welcome them in the village as guests. Jairi was enjoying all the free food and messing around until he saw Cain walking away into an isolated place. He asked Cain where he was going without eating anything, to which Cain told him to just leave him alone. Jairi stated to Cain that he must be hungry after the fight, then Cain replied that he didn't feel like he had that privilege. Jairi asked him why he was saying that, and Cain repeated that he wasn't actually able to help out in anything during the battle, and it was all the other adventurers who produced the results. Cain claimed to have had trouble with fighting even a single wolf which made him feel like he just came in the way of others. Jairi heard him and still offered the food while telling him that he didn't really need to worry about that, because he was house-sitting as well during the fight. And the fact that Cain participated in the battle was way better than what Jairi did. 
Kane told him not to mess with him as he was the third son of the S.H. Tall's family. So compared to an adventurer with no responsibilities like Jairi, he said he was not the same as him and Jairi just kept listening to what he kept on rambling about. After that, Kane started scratching his head in all the stress he was feeling because he was painfully aware that he actually had no talent or whatsoever. Kane remembered hearing the words of his family that he was just a disgrace to his S.H. Tall's family, and so he should be grateful enough that he was allowed to live in their household. Kane had no magic power since the moment he was born, and so he couldn't use any mana in fighting, whereas magic was essential to swordsmanship, and his lack of magic left him to solely rely on his physical prowess. But he still couldn't catch up to his brothers. And one day, his father told him that he would be given a high rank as an adventurer, because his father wanted to uphold his reputation in the city. And after that, Cain joined a party of high-ranking adventurers with him being given the rank B adventurer. But Cain still remained positive and thought of it as an opportunity to produce some good results to deserve the place he belonged. He didn't have any trouble getting an adventurer for his own party, and most of them were low-rank adventurers including D-rank adventurers. But at that time, Kane was fine with that and gave his comrades the equal treatment despite their ranks, and he had fun going on adventures with them until one day. He was walking in the hallway of their inn and noticed that his own party members were calling him an idiot behind his back. Kane didn't expect that as others claimed that they were just enjoying Kane's money because they were his comrades. Not only that, but they were also taking advantage of the fact that Kane was easy to give excuses to for getting money in exchange. Kane was hearing all of them talking like that, as they kept mocking him behind his back. They laughed the way Kane used to say they were comrades, and all they ever thought of Kane was nothing more than a sponsor of their activities. Kane was extremely hurt by what they said about him, and he learned that day that reality could be tougher to hear than seen. He ran away from there that day thinking about how he was the only one to think of them as his comrades. He started calling people like them as trash, and nothing more than parasites that cling to high-ranking adventurers. From that day, he believed that all of the low-rank adventurers were nothing but trash. So back to his current situation, Kane was feeling unwanted then Jairi told him to come and eat together if he changed his mind. But if he didn't hurry up then he would eat all of the food leaving nothing for him. And then again, Jairi took out another pouch of snacks from earlier and asked Kane to properly eat it and give his opinions on them this time. Kane felt a little relieved to have received something from someone without needing to worry about anything. It made him ask himself why Jairi cared about him despite being a D rank. Jairi felt like Kane had been living a hard life, so he thought a little about Kane should live carefree like him. But since it didn't matter to him, he kept eating like he had been for an hour. He wished to know what those sweets of his would taste like to a noble. After that, everyone involved in the incident took a break and enjoyed the feast held for them. They were now back to their peaceful escort journey, and since everyone could enjoy however they liked, Jairi decided to go somewhere with peace. He didn't want to be disturbed while having his peaceful time, whereas in a few minutes, Reddy appeared in her swimsuit to bathe and catch the fishes in the river. Other girls were there with her as well and then Jairi woke up only to find out that these girls were there in front of him right now. And thus, he was trapped there because if the girls were to know he was there he wouldn't make it out safely. Whereas girls were washing their bodies and enjoying the river bath while Jairi was watching them without wanting to do so. The situation had turned out bad for him when he just wanted to take a nap there. And in order to not get disturbed, he casted camouflage magic to make himself invisible so that he won't be found out. Although, if he even tried to move a muscle then this camouflage will break and get him labeled as a peeping tom. Lena then talked about how this client of escort request had been an oddball, since even if Fina was a noble, she was not arrogant about it even though she had to bathe alone for family reasons. She asked the other two how they felt about it as being nobles themselves. Dulkies replied that she was an adopted child, and Reddy mentioned her case wasn't all that different to Reddy's. Then Lena asked Dulkies how come she was talking with them today when she didn't want to be friends with them before. Dulkies told her to shut up and then she asked others if they were really safe from being watched by anyone. Her statement made Jairi's heart race faster. Then Lena told her they were going to be just fine because she had apparently used detection magic to check up the area, and then used barrier magic so that nobody would be able to enter. So, she figured that nobody without a high-level disguise would be able to go undetected by her, and it made Jairi realize that his camouflage magic must be high-level to be able to bypass her detection. Then Lena asked Dulkies why she was being so cautious when they were late wearing swimsuits, and teased her if she had a lover or someone she liked. Dulkies' heart skipped a beat and she claimed there was no need for her to tell anything about it. Lena continued teasing her saying she was surely in love to be taking care of herself so much for someone. 
Lena then noticed a change in Dulkey's expression and understood she did get someone like that. Lena claimed she was quite envious of her being able to fall for someone like that. Then just in case out of curiosity, she asked Dulkies what she would do if someone were to peep at her. Dulkies replied that she would make sure to make him regret even moving. Then Jairi let out a voice after startling. Lena then noticed she heard someone's voice from the open space in front of them, which got them thinking there must be a pervert after all. Jairi knew he messed up and now that they knew his location, they were sure to find him eventually. So seeing that he didn't have many options here, he used the last resort he had, which was to turn himself into a rabbit. The girls came to look in the suspicious area and found out it was just a rabbit. Jairi saw this as his chance to run away, but then Dulkies caught her and they started looking at the rabbit. Reddy stated that rabbit was supposed to be tasty, which made Jairi panic. He got himself in a worse situation than before, and his transforming magic was near its end since it has a short time limit. Dulkies found it too cute to be eaten, so she let it go and then Jairi the rabbit made his way to win the race not of the turtle but of his life. He managed to get out of that dangerous situation, and just when he got to escape with his dignity intact, he noticed some spirits gathering in front of him. And upon taking a closer look there, he saw a beautiful girl talking to the spirits and smiling as she was enjoying it. Jairi looked at her as if she were someone from a fairy tale. He called her beauty better than that of angels, with white hairs, ruby-like scarlet eyes and smooth figure. Then he realized that he just looked at something he wasn't supposed to and ended up making his situation even worse by ogling her like some pervert. After that, he kept running until he successfully made it out alive of Lena's barrier magic. Then he wondered if there was even someone who could use the barrier in their group. It had been five days since the escort quest started, and once Jairi got back to the other boys, Wed asked him to play cards with them but he replied that he didn't want to play with a cheater who would just win every time against him like before. Wed tried to play dumb about it, and Jairi noticed that their group had turned out to be livelier than he expected. He wondered if everyone got too relaxed that they forgot being on an escort quest. Then he stated that they would reach Edel in some time more, and it was about time for those who went to scout the Edel ahead to come back. He figured that his journey with them was about to be over. Then one of the scouts came back running as he breathed heavily. He shouted out to everyone that something bad happened ahead of them, and as Jairi and others listened to him, the guy couldn't speak anything for a second in fear. Fina calmed him down and asked what happened. Then the guy informed everyone that the city they were heading towards, the Edel, had been taken over by the monsters. After hearing the report, everyone quickly came over to Edel to check what was the situation there, and saw that zombies, skeletons, wraith, and all sorts of other undead monsters were spread throughout the entire city. Jairi stated that those monsters were not able to get outside the city's barrier, and defeating all of them was going to be difficult. Someone mentioned that these people could be the residents of this city, and Lena mentioned there was no other possibility than that as well because it was impossible for anyone to summon such a large number of undeads to fill the whole city. Fina panicked but she still didn't want to believe that, so she said that everyone must be hiding somewhere safely, and she was sure if that person she wanted to meet was there, then it must be okay there. Lena heard her being desperate and told her not to be so naive after seeing the situation of the city by herself. She stated there was no way that anyone would have survived this undead tragedy, which left Fina silent in disappointment. Whereas, Kane's reaction was even scarier from the fear of so many undead. He said it would be best for them to just get out of here then Wed told him that he was free to run away if he wanted to because he was still at a young age. He told Kane that nobody would think anything bad of him if he made that decision. Kane was shocked to see how Wed could just say that and imply that he would be fighting here. He said it would be a suicide to fight this many monsters. Wed told him there might not be much meaning to his actions, but it was the fact that even if the undeads were trapped inside the barrier, nobody could be sure how long they would be contained. So, he asked Kane what would happen if the barrier were to be taken down, and just where would the horde of undeads move next. Kane understood what Wed was trying to say, that if the undeads were to get out, they would just attack any town or village nearby them, and if that were to happen, they would require much more people to rescue that village. Wed stated that the nearby kingdom from here was the Universia Kingdom, and the truth was that his family lived there. So, Wed didn't have the option to run away because his family's life would be in danger if he did so. He asked Jairi if they could count on him and Kane to escort Lady Fina back to Universia, and ask them for backup. He also asked Hero Reddy and others to fight with him. Others already had come to a conclusion, and even Fina said she won't abandon them and stay as well. She wished to check something no matter what, and the panicked Kane muttered why this was happening. He exclaimed why nobody was running away even if this fight seemed way too out of what they could handle. 
he asked them if they didn't want to live, to which Wed answered that he was indeed afraid, but it was scarier for him to lose the person dear to him. Kane realized that these adventurers were not like those bastards from his past. He felt like this situation could very well be his chance to change himself by fighting together with them, and to gain his confidence back along with a chance to make some true friends. He asked others if he would be of any help to them. Jairi, Wed and others were surprised to see him initiate like that. Wed patted his back and told him that he was more than welcome and Jairi was happy to see how the situation turned out for everyone else, except for himself, because if nobody else was running away then it meant he had to fight as well which he didn't want to. He just wanted to go back to his city and sleep, then Wed called him out to give his verdict as well. Jairi felt pressured from the way things turned out and replied that he would fight as well. After that, they started coming up with a plan to go about things from here. Then Dulkies mentioned that the person who turned those residents into undeads must be close by so defeating the source would be their clear approach. But the problem was how to find them, so Wed asked Jairi if he could use his magic tool for that. However, Jairi had been trying to do that himself and couldn't find them. He was sure that if they used the highest rank of detection magic, then they might be able to find the culprit. Then Fina said that she had an idea. Her guard immediately tried to stop Fina, but she didn't stop this time and took out the transformation ring. Her guard called her out as Raphine tried not to make her take this decision. But Fina revealed her true identity as Raphine, and decided to use her clairvoyance for searching for the person who caused this situation of undead. Others were shocked to see Fina's true identity and her real beautiful appearance which caught their attention. It came out as a surprise to everyone that Fina had been the Princess Raphine all along as she claimed that she didn't want to reveal her true identity on this quest. But now that the situation called for it she decided to choose otherwise. Then Jairi recalled that the situation in the town before he took on this quest was lively because of Raphine being spotted in the town. So, he saw her again and started thinking of her beauty which was like a blooming flower. She was known as the only one to be able to use the clairvoyance which was also called as the highest ranking detection magic. He figured she was more like an idol than a princess because of her friendly nature with the kingdom's people. Then he recalled that this meant that back in the forest, it was Princess Raphine whom he saw bathing with spirits around her. He felt really guilty and scared not wanting it to be known to anyone, so he decided to do his best to hide that fact. Then her guard Shin asked Raphine if she realized what she was doing by putting herself in danger by revealing her true identity. Then Raphine ordered her to be quiet. She made it clear to Shin that she was doing it just because the situation was not something to be overlooked, and Raphine wanted to help out by using her clairvoyance to find the one who caused all this. Others agreed it would be the best way to find the culprit. Then Raphine began to cast her magic spell by asking the spirits to gather around her, and finally used her clairvoyance magic which started detecting everything in the whole area. Jairi found it amazing of her to be able to cast clairvoyance within a shorter time than it should take one normally. Not only that, but she was in perfect control of the large and dense magic power around her which was enough to be able to match that of an S-rank magician. He remembered how he tried to learn clairvoyance once before, but then he gave up on it because it required a lot of reading. He thought it would have been nice if there had been someone else around him who could use it so that he could learn straight from them practically. Then he got an idea that he might be able to try it himself by just seeing and doing what Raphine was doing. So he started at Raphine doing it with a lot of concentration, and so he tried his best to do just the same. Then he used his own clairvoyance which not only spread in the area around them but the whole of Edel. It was actually even more effective than the clairvoyance of Princess Raphine. Then Jairi sensed that the culprit was not in Edel but standing right behind them in the bushes. He didn't expect this would happen and the culprit would be already watching them from so close, as the cause of this phenomenon turned out to be a fierce and terrifying demon. Jairi noticed that others didn't seem to have noticed it including Raphine herself, which led him to realize that this demon must be of higher rank than even Raphine. He was scared of this demon as it might launch an attack on them anytime from their blind spots. Then the demon revealed itself and called them just some foolish humans. The demon called itself the Death Eater Calves, who was one of the four heavenly kings serving the demon lord. Calves then threatened them that their lives shall meet their demise at this instant now that they were confronting it. Raphine and other adventurers were all flinched after seeing Calves out there right in front of them. Raphine wondered how could the demon be so close to them when her clairvoyance didn't detect Calves at all. Calfs claimed that it was futile for her to think she would be able to detect him by such means, and stated that since they were unable to find him, he had to come out himself. 
The adventurers quickly decided to attack Kaf's thinking it might be effective from this distance and launched a void blade decapitation slash at Kaf's. Kaf's didn't even move from the spot since an attack like that was like a toy in his eyes. Kaf's declared that something like that won't work on it and as unbelievable as it might be. The demon launched an attack on the adventurer who launched an attack on it before, and to everyone's surprise, it was strong enough to put a hole through the body of that adventurer. Kaf's called everyone as mere inferior humans, and told them to do a favor by stopping to even try opposing a higher being like itself. After seeing the adventurer lying on the ground, Raphine immediately instructed Lena to cast the recovery magic on him, and Dulkies chanted high heel spell without any further ado. Whereas, Jairi was still thinking of the attack Kaf's used. He recognized it was a magic bullet, and so he barely managed to cast a lump of magic to block Kaf's attack from hitting the adventurer from before. But even after that he managed to make the magic bullet only weaker, which lead him to think how grave it could have been if he had not casted counter spell. Jairi saw that the healing magic would go fine, but it was just a short matter of time for the swordsman, and if he didn't get to go to a hospital in time he might lose his life. Kaf's asked them if they finally understood the position they were in, and while everyone was scared to make any sudden moves after seeing what happened, Reddy stepped up and challenged the demon with her holy sword. She planned on doing her best to fight the demon, and after seeing her holy sword, Kaf's understood that Reddy must be one of the heroes of this generation. Reddy admitted that Kaf's wasn't wrong about that, and then she claimed that the man standing beside her, Jairi, was her master and announced that he was 10 billion times stronger than Kaf's. The demon felt like she was joking, but Kaf's thought it was about time to get serious about the attacks from here on. Kaf sensed that there was someone who seemed to be stalling for time, and that someone turned out to be Lena who had been needing mana from some time in secret. Kaf's claimed that it got to go and report this situation of Edel to her demon lord and so she decided to finish off all the adventurers so that Kaf's could go and get praised by the demon lord. It turned out that Kaf's was actually a female demon, and she claimed to have also taken care of the black-haired hero that her demon lord was talking about. She got all the things of Edel from its people to the whole city, and after hearing about black-haired hero being no longer alive, Raphine was shocked because she had been waiting to meet him for nine years. She entered a state of despair after hearing that, and tried to deny that black-haired hero was dead. Kaf's claimed there was no reason for it to lie to inferior humans, and then she pointed out in a direction and asked Raphine to take a look there herself if she wanted to see the black-haired hero so much. Raphine was broken after seeing that, and as she fell down on the ground from feeling weak in her legs, Kaf said that black-haired hero was weak even if he was a hero with divine protection. Raphine felt like it was all over now that her fated one, the black-haired hero, died. Shin came to her aid and asked Raphine to come back to her senses. She told her it might just be some bullshit of the demon. Then Kaf said that she didn't even have to spend much time with that hero. After that, Kaf's decided to finish them off and so she inflicted excess gravity magic on everyone which made them feel extremely pressured on the ground. They were not able to get up even if they wanted to, and Kaf's claimed that their lives were sealed now that they won't be able to escape her. And while everyone's was down on the ground from excess gravity's pressure including Jairi, Jairi realized that this skeleton demon calf's power was greater than he expected. He figured it was surely dangerous if the demon managed to render even the rank adventurer, and ready helpless against just one spell. But it turned out that Jairi just didn't want to stand out during this escort quest, and not wanting to stand out was also why he had been lazing around at the D-rank. So, now that he felt like this was not the time for him to be lazy, Jairi finally decided to join some real action. He easily stood up from the ground, which caused Kaf's to ask just how a human like him was able to get up like that. Jairi then stood straight without feeling any pressure, and Kaf's tried to cast multiple excess gravity magic attacks on him but all of them seemed to not even phase Jairi. Kaf's was shocked after seeing that none of her attacks were working against him, which led her to ask him if he had some sort of tool to counter the effects of excess gravity. And our protagonist Jairi replied that he simply doesn't have or need any tools to withstand these stupid weak magic attacks. The demon told him there was no need to act so strongly, and mentioned that she was going to turn all of them into undeads at first, but now decided to just make them suffer a horrible death as Kaf's attacked him with another magic attack called Abyssal Flame. Jairi just looked at that attack and didn't even bother to move. Wed tried shouting out loud to ask Jairi to watch out and evade that attack, but as for Jairi, he confronted it with his bare hands. But to his surprise, the abyssal flames spread and covered his whole body all over, and what happened next left everyone astonished. Because the flames were still burning but for some reason, Jairi was completely unaffected by them. 
Jairi told them to stop shouting as it was annoying, but they were already silenced by the sight they were witnessing. Jairi told them it would be fine as he had withstood even a dragon's breath in the past. Wed was seeing something hard to believe for him, so he asked Jairi how he was even alive in that condition. Jairi claimed that he wasn't having any trouble, and then he grabbed the flames and just shook them off like nothing because he was annoyed by them. Kaufs was shaken down to her core after seeing her powerful flames to be erased like that. After which, Kaufs then planned on attacking him with another magic attribute, and so she launched the next magic attack called the Calamity Water Dragon. But Jairi just slapped it off, followed by a life-taking stone coffin which Jairi just kicked off like it was some annoying kid. After which, another magic attack storm of annihilation was just blown off by Jairi, which put Kaufs in a bind. The situation had escalated to the point that Kaufs had no choice but to use the single spell which she didn't want to use at any cost. It was a large-scale magic which seemed to use up a lot of mana for Kaufs just to chant it, and after she was done using up most of her mana in that spell, a large dark magic orb appeared in the sky which was about the size of the whole Edel city. The situation put everyone in fear except for Jairi. Jairi was standing tall as the fireball made of dark magic was about to hit them. Wed stated that a huge fireball might just destroy everything. Then Jairi raised his hand and assured others they would be okay, as he started using one of his magic spells called the Skill Interference, which completely vanished the meteor-sized fireball from the sky as if nothing happened. After that, Kaufs was left with no words to define this situation except asking him what the hell he did and just how. Jairi pointed out to Kaufs that her speech was not making sense anymore, after which Kaufs stated everything about Jairi seemed really inhuman. Jairi admitted he was just a human and leaving that aside. He reminded Kaufs that after so many magic attacks including the last one, she was out of mana at this point. Kaufs got shocked to be reminded of that by opponent, and as Jairi walked closer to Kaufs, the demon had a tough time believing to have lost against a human. Then Kaufs thought of another idea, and she used her magic to manipulate Kane to use him as a hostage. Kane stated that he was not coming between of his free will, but his body was moving on its own according to him. Kaufs revealed that it was her manipulation magic which didn't require much mana, not like she had any left, and planned on escaping death here through using Kane. She stated there was nothing he could do now, to which Jairi spoke up that he wasn't really friend with the guy she was holding hostage which scared off not just the Kane but the Kaufs also. She asked Kane if he wasn't really a friend, and his expression answered her. Then Wed told Jairi to stop joking around at a time like this, then he answered that everyone's relationship here was just of the acquaintances of the same quest, so calling him a friend wasn't fitting. Kafs called Jairi a horrible person which was more demon than a demon itself, which made Kafs considered taking all of the citizens of Edel as hostage. Wed asked what it meant by that since he thought that all of the humans of Edel were already dead, and Jairi understood what was the situation here. He spelled it out that Kaufs was using a falsehood barrier which could turn falsehoods into truth when specific conditions were met. He assessed the barrier in front of him and understood what were the conditions to activate it. Kaufs then tried to lure him into talking by asking him if he wanted to save the people of this city. And when Raphine heard it, she begged Jairi to save the people of Edel. She said she would really feel indebted to him if he did that. Then the demon Kaufs told Princess Raphine that everything would depend on a Jairi now, including the life of the person she seems to be worried about. Then Raphine stated to Jairi that she was willing to do anything if it meant saving the person she wanted to meet, which was why she begged him to help her out. Jairi understood that she was talking about the black-haired hero, but there was something not right about it, because if the guy was even a hero, then he surely would have been protected by his divine protection of the Holy Mark. He then asked Raphine if she was willing to do anything it takes, and her expression was answer enough he needed to take action. Jairi assured her that he would still help without making her do anything, and so he asked her to take a look as he used his purifying magic on the undeads of the whole Edel. Within a mere second, everyone in Edel got turned back into humans, however they don't recall anything from the time they became undead. Even the rumored black-haired hero turned back to human, and wondered if he was sleeping. To everyone in Edel, what happened was just some part of nightmares, as they stayed unaware about it being a reality. Kaufs asked him shockingly what had he done to the barrier, and he just smiled it off then explained that he just changed the conditions of the falsehood barrier casted by Kaufs, after which all it needed was just some of the turn undead magic, along with clearing skies, fixing the damaged city and all of which broke the barrier, and as a result, everyone turned back to living once again from the undead. He said he did only that much, but this was not by any means just this much specially coming from a human. Kaf started fearing him and immediately caught Kane closer and used him to escape from here. 
She warned him if he came any closer than Cain would be killed. Jairi saw that the demon had resorted to underhanded measures now. Suddenly, Cain exclaimed that he didn't mind if he died here rather than being a burden. He told Jairi that he should kill the demon along with himself. Kaufs was a bit horrified to see this human was willing to sacrifice himself, whereas Cain's reason rooted from how he was never needed by anyone before, so right now he didn't have anything to live for either. After that, Jairi told Cain that he was not trying to get him killed here. Cain didn't expect to hear that from him, as Jairi started using a magic spell while telling Cain that even if he was a bastard who thought of nothing but himself, he still needed him and for that reason he won't let Cain die. Jairi aimed his attack precisely at the demon and so it vanished into thin air. Cain was alright and others were also released from the gravity magic. After that, Jairi sighed as the tiring things were finally over and Wed quickly hugged Jairi from happiness. He shed tears of joy and asked him why he had been acting like a weakling at D-rank when he was extremely strong already. Raphine was impressed by how easily Jairi saved everyone, and even if the monster was one of the four heavenly kings of demon lords, all it took Jairi was just one attack. He was praised by everyone, so much that Jairi had to ask them to give him some space. Jairi didn't like having this much attention, so he thought for a second it would have been better if he hadn't fought after all. But looking at how happy everyone was again, he figured it wasn't that bad to do some actions from time to time. Suddenly, he felt an insanely strong bloodlust coming from nearby, and after looking around he noticed that it was targeted at Princess Raphine. Jairi saw that a fireball was directed at Raphine, so he quickly went over to her and protected her by using his own body as a shield. After the fireball hit his back, he was alright and looked back where it came from. It was when he was reminded that Lena had the same last name as that of the family of assassins. He wondered why she aimed for Raphine, but thought of putting it aside for now as the more important thing right now was to make sure Raphine was safe. He asked Raphine if she was okay. And she agreed, asking how he was, since he just took an attack straight on his back. Jairi assured her everything was all good except for his clothes, which were all tattered. He decided to throw these clothes and change with the spares he got in his item box, and when he removed his shirt, there were dozens of markings on his body from wounds, slashes, injuries, and among them there was a big scar which caught Raphine's attention. Raphine felt like this scar was familiar. She recalled a memory from her past, and if there was anything like a fateful moment, then that for her was when she met that certain boy. Her story took place exactly nine years ago when she pushed Shin for fun while they were playing the It game. Raphine was six years old at that time, and she was still acting childish all the time around the castle causing trouble for everyone. She remembered that her father adored her no matter what sort of prank she pulled. But one time she claimed that there was actually a reason behind her constantly playing pranks, which was that she felt lonely in her castle and whenever she tried to talk to her sisters, they didn't have time for her because they never liked her. Raphine was nothing but the stepsister from another mother, and they used to tell her it would be better if she just died. Although, Raphine was small at that time to understand what they meant. But since her father was also very busy, she had no family member to play with except her teddy with whom she used to talk whenever she was lonely. She wondered if there was anything bad with her, because no matter how much she wanted someone to look at her she was still alone. So one day, she slipped out of the castle and went to a secluded place which she used to treat like her play area. There she saw Jairi for the first time when he was doing his daily training of tens of thousands push-ups. She wondered who this boy was with beautiful black hairs, and unfortunately a weird mask on his face. She looked at him from the hiding, then Jairi noticed someone was watching him and asked who it was. He spoke out loud giving a warning to whoever was hiding or else he would come himself. Raphine felt a little scared from him then in the next moment, he appeared right in front of her. He stated it was just a child and told her this place wasn't meant for children so she should go home quickly or her parents would be worried. Raphine then exclaimed this was her place, so he should be the one to get lost. Jairi asked her why he should leave since this property wasn't anyone's, especially not hers. Then she claimed this was actually her secret base. Raphine then used her word magic to instruct him to leave, but Jairi hardly felt anything. It left Raphine with angry puffed up cheeks as her word magic didn't work for the first time. Then Jairi said sorry to himself if he had been rude to her, but Raphine started crying out loud. So, to make her stop crying, he decided to tell her an amazing story. Raphine somewhat stopped crying to hear a story from him, and after that she listened to quite a couple of stories from him. All of Jairi's stories were a lot more interesting to her than the ones she heard in the castle. 
she got absorbed in listening to his stories happily and after he got done with another story. Jairi asked her if her tears stopped then Raphine made a fake angry face and lord that she was still crying because she wanted to hear more stories from him. Jairi mentioned he could see she was not crying at all, so Raphine told him to just tell her more stories. He told her it was all for today and he would tell her more next day since it was getting dark. Raphine agreed and went back to her home saying she would see him tomorrow. And from that fateful day, she kept coming to her secret place every day and out of all the stories he told her, Raphine's most favorite was the one in which a hero defeats the demon lord and saves the world after which he married the princess. She liked the princess so much that she wished to be like her. She asked Jairi how she could become like her, to which he replied there was no way she could, because that princess talked in a polite manner unlike her, which made Raphine to quickly speak in a polite voice. He teased her for trying to mimic that princess from the story, and these were the blissful days she wished to continue forever. But the very next day, Raphine's secret base was filled with members of the Skull Guys who seemed to be waiting for Raphine to appear. Raphine remembered clearly how those bad guys waited there thinking of her as a kid from a noble family, and decided to extort her. The leader of the Skull Guys asked Raphine to come along with them quietly, but Raphine tried to oppose him by using her word magic to stop that guy in his way. The leader of the Skull Guys Palzar couldn't move his body, so he called her a stupid brat and asked to release his body. Raphine saw this as her chance to run away, but then someone else attacked her from behind and she fell on the ground. Raphine couldn't control that many people at once, and this was the first time she went through that much physical pain after being hit. She was crying on the ground, and after Palzar got released from her word magic, he changed his mind from extorting some money from her to sell her as a slave somewhere in another continent. He told Raphine that she won't ever get to see her parents again. They started tying her up and putting in a bag, while she was terrified from all that and wished that someone would just come to save her. Then a voice came calling out those skull guys, and that voice belonged to none other than Jairi. He asked them exactly what they were doing to her, and soon enough, Jairi knocked many of those skull guys. Paulzar didn't expect that one little kid would be able to do this much damage to his people, which made him wonder who this brat might be to be able to defeat that many of his underlings just like that. Paulzar told him not to get carried away and charged at Jairi with his longsword. He hit Jairi's sword away from his hands and it went flying a few meters away from him. Paulzar told him it was useless for Jairi to think he was like some hero if he was going to die here for some kid. Jairi was pissed off and he asked Paulzar if he was this strong. Then why was he doing things like kidnapping and violence when he could just try plenty of other paths? Paulzar thought Jairi was just pleading for his life, but Jairi was seriously trying to tell Paulzar that plundering from the weak was not a decent life in any way. He didn't understand why the likes of Paulzar even existed. Then Paulzar spoke up in a rude voice that he was doing these things because he got fun from doing them. According to him, living life normally was too boring and then he reminded Jairi that in this world, it was all about survival of the fittest as he swung down his sword at Jairi, but Jairi stopped his sword with his bare hand. Paulzar was left astonished to see that just a kid stopped an attack of his sword from one hand, and then Jairi decided it was enough now. He broke the sword just from his grip and caught Paulzar's neck with his right hand. Paulzar felt the strength behind Jairi's hand and understood that Jairi had not been serious about the fight from the beginning. Jairi asked Paulzar to swear that he would surrender himself to the Knight's Order or else he would kill him right here and now. Paulzar started acting and swore that he won't do these kinds of things again and go on to live a proper life from now on. He said he was sorry and had been a bad person through and through all the killings stealing, and especially, resorting to underhanded measures like how Paulzar's other comrades saw this as a chance to take Raphine as a hostage to make sure they would come out safe. The Skull Guys started taking advantage of having the girl as hostage, and one of them stomped at Raphine to take out anger on his nose being broken. Paulzar then warned Jairi not to move, and if he did then the girl inside the bag would be beaten. He stated it would be in his best interest not to do anything, and Jairi clenched his fists, but he didn't do anything knowing the danger of this situation. Paulzar then pointed it out to Jairi how he avoided attacking everyone's vitals, which showed that he lacked any fighting resolve to kill, which was funny since he was fighting a battle where those guys would kill him given any chance. Jairi understood that Paulzar lied about swearing to stone his sins, and for a fact, he hated being lied to. After that, Paulzar asked Jairi to release the body strengthening magic or he would kill the girl and Jairi did just that to make sure Raphine would be safe. Then the moment he undid the strengthening, 
the Skull guys started punching him one after another. They took their turns on taking revenge on him for the beating earlier, and Jairi just kept taking damage from their punches to their kicks. After much beating, Paulzar stopped them and asked Jairi to wake up as he thought that Jairi was about to lose consciousness. But Jairi looked like he couldn't get up by himself, so Paulzar pulled him up by his hairs and told him that he was quite strong for a kid at that age, and it would be a shame to kill him right now. And so, Paulzar offered Jairi to join his Skull Brigade and said that he would make sure that Jairi would become his right-hand man, which was the number two position out of 300 people from the Skull Brigade. But Jairi refused his invitation which made Paulzar kick him in the stomach to remind him that he was not exactly in a position to say no. But now that he declined either way, Paulzar claimed it was about time to put an end to this if he denies again. Then Jairi got up all wounded and he covered himself up with magic energy. He used to heal himself and got up from injured state to being completely fine, as Paulzar asked him why he was moving when they were still having the upper hand. Then Jairi told him that having a hostage was not a problem anymore, and when Paulzar turned to look at his guys, he found that Jairi had somehow taken down all of them and noticed that they looked like they killed themselves. He asked Jairi what did he exactly done to them, and Jairi admitted that he was indeed lacking the resolve to kill because earlier he used to think that he would need to fight only monsters to become a hero. But now that he learned there were people like Paulzar and the Skull Brigade, he finally found his resolve that he might need to clean his hands on some bad humans as well. So, in order to achieve his goal of becoming a hero, he abandoned his intention of killing Paulzar, and each Skull Brigade guy here. Jairi despised people like them which made it easy for him to kill and Paulzar tried to attack him straight on as the last resort. But suddenly his knife and his body stopped as it was all tied up from Jairi's spider net. He said that he didn't want to use this magic because of how deadly it was, and that he lacked training on it right now. So after that, he took his sword and started getting closer to the terrified Paulzar to put an end to this just like how Paulzar wanted to. Jairi pointed his sword at him as he declared now that he found his resolve. He won't hesitate even for a bit to not show any mercy to Paulzar. He cut through Paulzar's body from the middle and sent his upper body separate from the bottom. After that, Jairi quickly went to Raffine and used healing magic on her to cure any wounds she gained from before. He asked her if she was okay, then Raffine thanked him for saving her and when she tried taking a look at those beaten up guys, Jairi suddenly pulled her closer to himself so that she won't get to take a look at the way he cut Paul's are. He figured it wouldn't be a pleasant sight for her, so he asked Raffine to not look around and informed her that the people who attacked just now were some bandits in this area, but now they were taken care of. Raffine asked him why he saved her by risking his own life, to which he answered that it was a given for heroes to save people so he didn't need a reason to protect her. His words made her heart flutter and he felt her body temperature increasing. He put his hand on her forehead to check, which made her flustered even more than before. He told her that he would carry her closer to her home, and on the way, she asked him if he was a hero. Jairi replied he wasn't a hero yet, but someday he would definitely become one because it was his dream. The sight of Jairi's serious face at that time was something she could never forget and so she assured him that she would be cheering on for him, being sure that he could achieve whatever he wished to. And later on, she realized what she felt for that boy was love, and from that day, she wished to meet him more often. But one day, when she went there, she found Jairi lying on the ground with a huge wound cut open on his chest. She quickly checked what happened to him, and when she saw that his bleeding was only getting worse, Raphine immediately ran back towards the castle to call some people for help. And when the royal healers tried to heal him, they sensed some sort of magic was interfering with their healing magic. Raphine was crying and all she prayed from the god at that time was for him to get better, and after some time, she wasn't sure if it was her prayers or just continuous efforts of the healers, but the boy finally escaped death by miracle. And when she asked him if he was completely healed already, he agreed to it, which made her happy and asked him if they could play again the next day. But Jairi stood up and claimed that he won't be coming to this place anymore. She shockingly asked the reason behind it, to which he answered that he had important battles awaiting him. And when she asked him if she could come along, he told her that she would just get in the way so she couldn't come. But he knew she wouldn't just agree to it, so he gave her a ring and informed her it was a magical tool called the Ring of Transformation. He assured her that he would make sure to come out victorious from his battle, and asked her to remain patient until then. She thought that this scene was like the story she liked, and considered that he might be going to fight the demon lord. So, she replied to him that she would always be waiting for him. And after that day, just like he said before, he really did stop coming to their meeting place. Not only that, but Princess Raphine thought that since the boy was doing his part of reenacting the story she liked, she figured she should do the same. 
and in order to become an ideal princess, she improved herself and since she didn't know where the boy she met was, she spent a lot of her time focusing on using detection magic. So, in order to find him, she used it so much that she gained the clairvoyance magic. But even so, she kept waiting and waiting and now nine years have passed since then. She tried to search for him again using clairvoyance every now and then but came out with zero results, which increased her anxiety over time. Until one day, she got some information about a black-haired hero appearing in the neighboring country of Edel. But unfortunately that information turned out to be wrong. But she wasn't feeling bad about it as she finally got to see the boy she wanted to meet and this was when she learned that boy's name was Jairi all along. He asked her why she was staring at him for some time. Whereas she reminisced about why she didn't notice until now that there were plenty of odd things, and she thought she was dumb to think he would have a younger appearance. Jairi then told her if she kept staring too much at him, then he would feel embarrassed, which didn't look like that at all. He asked her if she finally noticed how good-looking he was, and Raphine smiled as she admitted that he was really good-looking. She went ahead and hugged Jairi because she was so happy after finally finding her faded person. After one day, the party member who had hole through his body was now recovering at a medical facility, and as for the undead's infestation in Edel, Jairi purified the whole land along with tampering other people's memories so that they won't remember about the incident. And while it was all happening, the rumored black-haired hero in Edel was jailed for falsifying a hero's mark. And just like that, peace returned to Edel, except someone else's peace was taken, as Jairi claimed to have a serious problem in his hand at the moment. And this problem was none other than the Princess Raphine who was just talking about having a marriage with him at the largest ceremony hall in the kingdom. She wished to always be together with Jairi from now on and not separate even for a moment. She asked him how many children they should have, as she claimed to be wanting many with him. Jairi recalled that after that incident, the party members started asking a lot of questions about what happened so he dipped them, after which he just came to his room at the inn to sleep, and he was sure that he was alone at night. So the big question now was how did Raphine manage to get inside his bed, and why was she following him around when she was looking for a black-haired hero? Raphine blushed and asked him why he was questioning her when they were fated to marry one another. He didn't understand what she was talking about, so she told him that the scar he had on his chest was also on the chest of the fated person she was looking for. And when he was little, he came to save her at that time as well. Jairi didn't remember anything like that, and after thinking about it, the things Raphine told him about the black-haired boy she used to play with nine years ago in detail, he figured that he won't be able to remember it because, at that time, he was training heat sense together with present sense, and so he was wearing a black mask all the time to block his vision entirely because he thought that in order to become a hero, he needed to save some people for the holy mark to appear. So around that time, he saved a lot of people but couldn't actually remember every one of them. And when he heard her say that he gave her a transformation ring and went off to fight the demon lord, he recalled that around that time, he went to participate in an auction of magical tools. Although, he didn't get to get his hands on the tool he had his eyes set on. He was sure that he wouldn't have promised Raphine to marry her because he saved her for his own sake to become a hero. Jairi understood it was all just a misunderstanding on her part. Then Raphine got flustered by him looking at her like that for quite some time. Jairi then asked her if she could get away from him for now, but she got it harder and started getting even closer while calling him dear. Jairi then clearly asked her to listen to him, and so he asked what she would do if he told her that he didn't promise to marry her, or something like he didn't save her for some noble reason, then what would she do? Raphine told him that she would simply die because she couldn't live without him. Jairi was shocked to hear that, and Raphine's love was actually contagious as she told him that he must not look at anyone other than herself. He tried thinking of the possible things he could do without making her die because of him, while he also didn't want to marry her because it would mean for him to become the king, which he didn't want at all, so it left him with one option. He asked Raphine if she would do something for him, and when she agreed, he asked her if she could give him back the transformation ring. Raphine quickly got on her guard and asked him why he wanted the symbol of their love back from her. But he didn't intend that ring to be like that, so he knew that he should take the kind of measures that he doesn't like to do much. So he got closer to pin her down on the bed, and assured her that they would be together from now on. So a thing like that ring was not needed anymore. He held her hand and gripped it, then she answered she believed in him. He was relieved to have managed to get her to agree, and after taking the ring, he stated that he would go to the toilet for a bit. Raphine listened to him and said she would also go with him. He told her that would be awkward, but she wanted to be with him in everything. He stopped her by stating they should take things slowly, 
to which she guessed it would be okay since they were going to be together from now on. He was troubled by how happy she was to be with him and so he left the room. And once he was out of the room, it was time for him to take the only option he thought he had, which was to run away from everything. He used the transformation ring to change the color of his hairs to red, and tried thinking of where he should run. Then he remembered about someone named Char whom he got those snacks from, and so he decided to go to her place. Whereas, Kane was at the Adventurer's Guild and he decided to take the decision of willingly demoting himself from B-rank to D-rank unexpectedly. Kane stated he just thought of demoting himself because he didn't deserve B-rank as of now. The guild employee then asked him that he might be able to get C-rank with his swordsmanship at least, and Kane recalled having rechecked at his entry exam again that he was able to defeat a C-rank adventurer, and even he was surprised to see that he won. But he figured that he never really tested himself against a monster or his brothers who always took on quests higher than C-rank. Kane also thought it would be nice for him to start from the same rank as Jairi, which made him happy. He figured that he should become strong enough to be able to be of use to him one day, because his words moved his heart and helped Cain change himself. Then some adventurers called out Cain to inform him about the time of carriage, and they seemed to be Cain's new companions. After the escort request, Cain had gone around the guild to apologize for causing troubles, after which he got into a party which he once rejected. He was lucky that those people were kind enough to accept him when he was anxious if they would. After that, Kane told the receptionist it was about time for him to leave, then she reminded him that he missed writing his family name in the form. Kane replied that he actually left it on purpose and walked on his way. He told her that from now on, he was just Kane, not including his family name at all, which made him feel like he was starting a new life. Meanwhile, in the Rathasvik continent where Demon Lord's castle was located, the Demon Lord was yelling out what was going around her castle and where was Calf's? Then Calf's came running to Demon Lord crying while asking her to listen to her. The Demon Lord Lena asked Calf's why was she crying and more importantly why was she in that scary appearance. Calf's forgot changing her appearance before entering, and she transformed herself into human form. She exclaimed that her stock of lives was pretty much gone, which was why it took time for her to reconstruct herself. Luna asked Calf's if she did what she asked him to, about checking up on the black-haired hero, and also buying some sweets for her along with it. Calf's replied that she thought of gifting everything to her demon lord Luna, so she turned the whole Edel into a city of undead. But this news made Luna shocked because this was the worst case scenario which she didn't want at all. Luna fell down in disappointment, and Calf's thought she must be surprised at her capability. Whereas, the reality was that the black-haired hero's case was just a facade and Luna actually wanted Calf's to buy her some sweets. And now that Edel was gone according to her, she wanted to stop being a demon lord if it meant she couldn't eat what she wanted. Then she asked what happened to the city since Calf's was here, to which Calf's informed her that an absurdly strong human came and turned people back. She showed Luna the image of Jairi, just his image was enough to scare off the demon lord Luna. Calf's asked her what was wrong, to which she replied that this guy looked exactly like a devil in human form who once chased after her for three days and nights without a pause. She felt a near-death experience with him and thought if she were to meet him again then she might die. Luna thought back that she didn't really want to become a demon lord, moreover she didn't want to fight anyone in the first place and live peacefully. She thought if she hole herself up in this castle then she might just get done in. So she decided that from now on she would go on a snack-eating tour. Meanwhile at the same time, Lena the assassin was mesmerized by the sight of that person who might just be able to meet her standards. The person she was talking about was none other than Jairi, with the ability to make instant decisions coupled with frightening strength. She figured he might just be able to survive no matter what she threw at him, and also accept all of her urges. Lena was overjoyed by that and started laughing out loud. Lena was excited most by those kinds of battles that bring one close to the edge of life, because of which she also originally took the escort quest with the mission to assassinate Raphine. She wanted to kill Jairi first as fast as possible, but the way she was now, she was aware that she was no match for him. And since it was the assassin's first rule not to fight an opponent stronger than them, Lena figured that she might need to ask for some guidance, which made her think about someone particular location to go for her training. And as it seemed, Jairi reached his destination, which was his favorite country of sorcery, Majiko's Maya, while Kane, Lena and even the snacks hunting demon lord were all coming on their way to the same country. Here in this country of Majiko's, Jairi's day began with him waking up then again going back to sleep. He was happy to finally be able to have a comfortable sleep after tragic events like getting invited to the hero's party 
and being proposed to by the princess. Being lazy was the best thing above everything else for him. Then Char came to wake him up since he had been sleeping too much. He was annoyed by her trying to wake him up just when his sleep was at its peak. He wanted to sleep badly because he hadn't been able to get any proper rest since that escort quest started. He recalled when he tried to get some sleep in the cabin out of town. He was disturbed by Reddy, after which came the quest, then having to fight calves. That was not all since the princess decided to stalk him thinking he was her fated person. And in order to run away from her, he changed the color of his hairs to red and came to Char. Char was a girl he had connection with from the past, and she had taken care of him many times in the past including providing him shelter. And to come to this country magic Osmea. He ran all the way without resting thanks to which he arrived in just two days while it would have taken twelve days even from the carriage. Which was why he was more tired than usual and just wanted to sleep, so he told Char to come back to wake him up three hours later. Char was troubled by hearing that because he said the same to her the previous day but didn't get up at all. She yelled at him to wake up while shaking him as hard she could. He told her this much level of shaking was not enough at all to wake him up, and asked her if she forgot that he had the divine blessing of sleep. He was just bluffing though, but it was true that her shaking was like a cradle to him. Char believed him and asked if his sleep blessing evolved, to which he replied that she was right about his sleep evolving into eternal sleep. Char understood he was just fooling around, and so he finally woke up with her last call. He was somewhat close with Char Anidman, an elf girl who played along with his jokes. He stated she may look like a frail young girl, but her actual age was over 500 years old and in the past Du was known throughout the world as the strongest assassin. He met her when he was still training to become a hero and at some point, he unexpectedly became the target of assassinations. She came to assassinate him but eventually failed to do so, and just when he was about to finish her off, she started crying about how she didn't want to do assassinations anymore. It was when he gave her some candy to calm her down, and it was so sweet for her that she took a liking to it. In the end M, she got attached to him and now in the present time, Char came to become the owner of an infamous pastry shop known as Chartit. Then he noticed something in Char and after calling her out, he got closer to her which gave her some other thoughts, but all he had to say to her was that she had some bad hair. Char got annoyed by his prank and she yelled at him to not do things like these because they were easy to misunderstand like that, especially for girls like her. He said sorry for that, and afterwards they sat down when Char informed him that a person with black hairs with being cute as an angel came to the store earlier, and asked if she had seen someone with black hairs. He thought at first if it could be Raphine, but ignored since she had white hair, and he made sure she didn't know that he was here. Then Char informed him that their new product was a huge success thanks to his help for coming up with another idea. She was grateful for him telling her about his opinions on her products. He stated that he didn't do that much and she deserved to have the credit Char. He recalled that he only read about those in books before. Char liked to be with him and as one of his best friends, she allowed him to stay in her shop and place all the time. While he was here he wouldn't need to work at all since she would take care of everything. No matter how lazy Jairi was, he still felt like being this much pampered was a little much. Jairi told her that he already owes her a lot and so he first wanted to repay what he owed to her. But Char was fine with it because he was her friend. After that, Char mentioned that since he liked magic tools so much, she got him a ticket for the 57th Sorcery Tournament of Magic Osmea, and she also informed him that the prize pool of this magic tournament also had a magic tool for the person. She knew Jairi was very fond of collecting magic tools, but he thought he might not be able to enter since tournaments like these are supposed to be private. The requirement to enter the tournament was to be part of an organization, or institution, and having a recommendation letter from them to be able to fight in the tournament. If not that, one was required to be at least in a rank adventurer. Jairi knew he didn't fit any criteria, but Char confirmed to him that the ticket she had was his with legal recommendation. He took the ticket to see for himself and the ticket really started him on it with affiliation of the Royal Magic Academy and its principal. Jairi didn't recall ever becoming a lecturer or a janitor, so he asked Char to explain it. Then suddenly a voice came from behind them which belonged to someone claiming to explain things from here on. The person in the quest was a cat-like creature who seemed to have known Jairi for a long time. Jairi looked at the cat which spoiled his mood and asked why he was here. Jairi was oppressed to see all the Audas, a fairy king called Cat Sith and right now he was the principal of the Royal Magic Academy. But Aldi told Jairi that he was actually invented here. Jairi understood it must be Char who invited him, and Char just smiled back at him, as she agreed to him that she asked Aldi to write that recommendation. Then Jairi told her to wait for some time while he took Aldi to have a serious talk. 
After that, he took Aldi to a room and told him to update OK what was going on, or how he wrote a recommendation for his participation without his permission. Aldi told him he was asked by Char so he didn't have much choice. Jairi told him that he must be aware of the consequences for doing that even after knowing he didn't like participating in these types of events. Aldi apologized that he thought Aldi might have changed by now while averting his eyes. Then Aldi asked him to look him in the eyes while saying that again. Aldi immediately asked him to cancel this all and forget as if it never happened. Also he wasn't affiliated with the Royal Academy in the first place anyway, so he should not make fake documents for him. Aldi informed him that Jairi was now affiliated with the Royal Academy officially, so he should be fine entering the tournament. Jairi then asked Aldi to come out with the real reason behind it instead of messing around, and Aldi said he would be happy if Jairi decided to stay with them for life which would also give him more chances of researching Jairi's magic power. Jairi declined and said he would tell Char the same about him not entering the match. Jairi remembered to this day about the time when he first met Aldi four years ago, when he had just arrived at Magikosmea and saved Aldi from S-ranked monsters. Since that moment, Aldi had been wanting to invite Jairi to his academy to become a lecturer there, and also requested to let him research Jairi's magic. After that, Aldi's behavior started getting more and more annoying, to the point that he had to agree to joining Aldi as a research assistant. He was troubled but still agreed to keep the research until it was for the purpose of measuring his magical power. However Aldi's research started requiring Jairi's gnaw and hair samples which got too scary for Jairi that he had to make an escape from the research lab. That was how Aldi also became one of the people to join his blacklist, or simply, to stay away from. Aldi told him he was happy to be able to meet with him once again like this, and mentioned it was quite terrible after he ran away. And even if they tried looking for him they found nothing which led them to believe Jairi might have died. Jairi was reminded again that he was actually wearing a red wig back then, so neither Aldi nor Char knew the real color of his hair was black. He didn't want to reveal it to them either so that it would keep convenient options open for him. After that, he again confirmed to Aldi that he won't be going to become a lecturer because he didn't like those kinds of annoying things. Aldi claimed he can't really say much personally about it, and reminded Jairi that Aldi wasn't the only one he needed to say that to. Then Char asked them if they finished talking, to which Jairi came out clear to her that he would be cancelling his entry from the tournament. Hearing this news made Char cry and thus the situation took an unprecedented turn for him. Char couldn't stop crying, and she said sorry to him for not thinking about him before, and also to trouble him by being so selfish to think for him. Jairi tried comforting her that she didn't trouble him at all but it was something he just didn't want to do, which made Char cry even more to make him do something he doesn't like. Then seeing he had not much of an option here to make her not to cry, Aldi came and asked Jairi what he would do about this situation now. Jairi then saw no other way to stop Char from crying, so he claimed that he was just joking and he would enter the tournament for real. Char stopped crying after hearing that, and she started smiling after having misunderstood that she bothered him. Aldi was happy to see how things were turning out like, while Jairi was now left with not many options. And so, Aldi congratulated him on becoming a lecturer in his Royal Magic Academy, and said he would welcome him with open arms. Jairi scolds Aldi because in a way, his position as a lecturer and participant were all framed, but still he started to attend the Magicosmia Magic Academy, just lay down to enjoy the refreshing breeze, and the warmth of the sun. He felt relaxed in the grounds doing nothing but enjoying them. The reason he was able to laze around the academy's grounds was that he couldn't participate in the tournament unless he was affiliated with the academy, so he needed to work in the academy somehow. But since he didn't want to teach all of a sudden, he decided to affiliate with the academy as its janitor. And so, his work was to just activate the magical tools which were scattered all around the academy's grounds used for cleaning and mending. These tools required one to have a huge amount of mana, and for a normal person, it would take them at least 15 days to complete the task. But as for him, he did it just in yesterday's night, and now that his work was all done, he was free to slack off all he wanted. He was galled that he didn't need to do any lectures and still get paid for just sleeping. Jairi felt like this was the best job for him. Then he heard a teacher scolding some students to attend their lectures. Those students didn't want to attend the lectures, so one of them just decided to go somewhere else. Jairi looked at them from the sidelines and thought that these children were just some problem children who skip lectures. He decided to go somewhere else to slack off and sleep, then noticed that the same skipping student brought a book along with him to study. The student named Luda's side as he could now concentrate on studying something, and Jairi looked over at him from behind a tree. The student Ludas found that book way too difficult for him to study as he exclaimed who brought it. 
to which one of his friends Sino replied that it was his own idea to hold that white magic book and ask others to come with him. Sino called him stupid for taking others out with them like that. Then Ludas argued if she was calling him stupid, and if so then she should try to read it for herself. Their friends tried to calm them down and suggested it would be better if the lecturers were to teach them. Ludas stated that so far the lecturers had only been giving them textbook lessons so far, so he wanted to get better results from studying by himself. But the elders just refused to teach them high-level magic even if they asked them to. But it could be understood what might have been the reason behind it. Meanwhile, Jairi was listening to those students and realized that these students were not slacking off but actually wanted to put some seriousness into their studies. He wondered what could be their goal which drove them to reach this level of enthusiasm. Then Ludas got tired of the book because no matter how much he tried, he couldn't get what it said. Ludas wondered if there was anyone well-versed in magic who wasn't a lecturer and could teach them. And while he was thinking that, Jairi was standing right behind the tree behind those students. Jairi thought this had nothing to do with him, and suddenly Ludas claimed he got an idea. He thought of trying to force the magic as they wished it to be, thinking that it would be fine even if he were to fail. While others tried to tell Ludas not to be that reckless about it, Ludas said it would be fine as he tried to imagine how could high-level magic be used. And once he thought he was ready to go, Ludas straight up tried using the high heel magic on his healthy arm. After using it, Ludas thought it worked, but the next moment after he thought he was some kind of genius, his genius arm got severed and fell down before he knew it. Ludas got scared and suffered in extreme pain not knowing why he got injured from high heel. Fortunately, Jairi was still there behind them and he saw what Ludas did. Jairi knew that it was dangerous to use magic without understanding its properties, and so he knew that a magic spell like a high heel might just not work for a completely healthy body. And if anyone tried to force some magic, then the end result was always the excess healing along with causing necrosis. He figured that he might just not get any relaxing time even in this country, as he used his high healing magic. Sino was about to call out for teachers to help them, but then Ludas saw that his arm got attached back to his body. Ludas and other children were surprised to see how it could have happened, or who might have used magic like that. They figured TH Caster must be around, so they started looking, whereas Jairi immediately hid himself to make sure not to be caught by them. He wanted to get away before they spot him, because if they ended up finding him then they might end up asking him to teach them, which would be way too much for him. And the next day, the students came to him claiming that if they win a challenge against him they would have him teach them while some of them weren't sure if someone with cloudy eyes really saved them before. Jairi ended up in this situation after a series of events, and now it was decided that he would have a duel with the students. He explained how it all happened when the students went to see the principal to report him about everything that happened to them. Then Aldi lit up their hopes by telling them that Jairi was the only one who was able to cast such magic, and thus the student ended up asking him to teach them magic. Jairi refused them at first but after they kept nagging, he reluctantly agreed if the students met a few conditions then he would teach them. So, he promised them if they were able to wound him even a little in three minutes then he would teach them magic. But if they can't manage that, then, they won't get themselves involved with him any further. Ludas agreed and called him an old man, as he asked Jairi not to take them lightly. Whereas the thing Jairi didn't take lightly was being called an old man, so he yelled out that he was just 18 in age. The students had a tough time believing that because Jairi looked like a 26-year-old to them. After that, Ludas decided to go first, then Jairi stopped him and told all of them to come at once to him. Hearing that, Ludas got mad thinking that Jairi was still taking him lightly. And so, he took out his sword and started chanting his flame magic into it until he released a fire slash in the air aimed at Jairi. Jairi thought he did it, but his attack apparently had no effect or whatsoever on Jairi. Jairi didn't even have to do anything. And after seeing he wasn't injured, the students felt that Jairi was surely tough. Jairi understood after seeing his attack-oriented high-level fire magic. And he gets it now why was he acting carefree before? After that, Ludas instructed others that they should use their trump card. Ludas got the other students to listen to him, and they started chanting magic spells together at the same spot. Jairi was surprised after seeing the dedication of these students, and how they were coordinating to use the combination magic. The combination magic was one in which multiple people use multiple elemental spells to attack, and it not only requires one to understand the formula of how to use it, but also a precise magic control. But suddenly their combination magic circle broke off from Jairi's spell interrupt magic. He told them that their casting was too slow, and reminded them that their enemies won't wait for them if they were to be in a field. 
He had guessed they wouldn't be able to get him either way. Then suddenly he felt Ludas trying to sneak behind him to attack straight on with the magic wand. He apologized for the sudden attack but he was doing it to learn magic. Jairi managed to block that attack just from his arm and called them naive to think he would fall for that. Jairi mentioned they were really putting their minds to it after seeing how they used the combination magic as a fake. While their true intention was this surprise attack, the students got desperate and said it was not over yet. But Jairi took the liberty to inform them that their time of three minutes was over, which meant that he won. He was happy about it, whereas the students were all upset after doing all the hard work and fighting for nothing. Then Jairi asked them out of curiosity about why they were learning magic, and he learned from them that they were all from very high societal positions for being nobles. But, they wanted to become adventurers and explore the world, for which they were trying to teach him. They didn't want to be used as political tools in a marriage. After learning their reason, Jairi understood that he can't ignore them because they shared the same dream as his own. He regretted asking them that question because now after seeing their enthusiasm, he stated that he would teach them but to make sure for them not to get the wrong idea. He made it clear that Jairi was doing this for his own sake not theirs. Jairi stated that he wanted to see them become adventurers because without any skills, they were sure to die like a dog which would make him feel bad. The students were overjoyed to hear that and they immediately started to call him teacher, asking all the questions they had been holding in at once. They wanted to know how he managed to erase their magic before, and also to teach how to use healing magic like his. Jairi felt uncomfortable after being called his teacher, so he yelled at them the very first day of teaching to make sure to let them know better to stop asking so many things at once when he was going to teach them already. After that, he took on their classes to teach them magic in his own way. But students were not getting what he was trying to say, so they asked him to explain it in more detail. Jairi knew this was going to be such a pain but now that he gave his words to them, he would keep them. Jairi asked Ludas if he wanted to learn about how he was able to come out unscathed in their duel. And after Ludas nodded, Jairi explained that the output of his body reinforcement magic was overwhelmingly more powerful than their attack, which was why their attacks got cancelled. And to put it all in simpler words, his magic was stronger than theirs. Ludas asked why his advanced magic got cancelled against Jairi's beginner-level body reinforcement magic. Jairi informed him that this happened because he was too caught up in chanting the magic, and taught them that magic was actually something more free than people believe in present times. And to make them understand, he went to the window and showed a small beginner-level fireball magic. But the catch in his attack was that it was stronger than how a beginner-level magic was supposed to be. Ludas was surprised to see his fireball, and Jairi explained that people actually misunderstood that the beginner magic was weak, while the case was that it could be stronger if the mana output was increased a little bit. So, they could even use a fireball to repel advanced level magic spells. And once his explanation got completed, the class bell rang and he said it was about time for them to stop the class for the day. Then Sino came to say something to him, and he told her that he won't answer anything outside the class. Sino stated that she had something else to say and pointed out to the outside of the window where Jairi hit the fireball earlier. There was now a huge hole in the ground which made him understand that he did something he would be in trouble for now. And in the end, it really became a massive incident and since Jairi was responsible for it, he was asked to give the school 30 million rain as compensation for the damages. And so, he fell into the need of money quite hard. Jairi now needed to come up with 30 mil in 10 days, so the only way he could see for that to happen was to win at the magic tournament at all costs. Not only that, but the feeling of having to pay debt from prize money was more like a burden. Then his stomach started sounding, and he urgently needed food right now. He shouted out loud if there was any place where money flowed in abundance, and then someone asked him to be quiet. When he looked at her, he immediately recognized she was Eve Dulkies from before when he met her in the escort quest. She also recognized him and asked if he was trying to change his image from his different hair colors. He told her that he just changed his hair color as he thought red was suitable for him. She refused that his hair colors didn't suit her, so she asked him why he was here in this country. Jairi replied that a lot of things happened and now he was entering the magic tournament. He asked why Eve was here instead of being an attack at Reddy's party as if she was kicked out. Eve told him that she wasn't kicked out from the party, and the reason for her being here was that she was a graduate of this academy, and recently, the principal Aldi called her out to teach her white magic. This just added up another problem for Jairi, and he damned Aldi for making just about anyone a lecturer. After that, Jairi wondered what happened to Reddy and Lena since she was here, to which Eve replied that apparently, Reddy got summoned to another place to fight the monsters, while Lena's whereabouts were unknown since the escort request ended. So, after thinking about it, 
He analyzed that he should avoid dangerous places to decrease the chances of him running into Reddy. And as for Lena, he didn't really think he could get a grasp of where she could be found since she was the one who tried to assassinate Raphine. But he couldn't act on that since he lacked any proof, aside from that. Eve asked him if he did anything to the princess, because she had been asking everyone about where Jairi could be. Jairi couldn't actually stand normally without feeling nervous in this condition after running away from Raphine like that, so he just tried to play dumb. He also requested Eve to keep his whereabouts hidden from others. Even then signaled him with her hands that keeping secret would cost him. Jairi was willing to keep his location secret even at the cost of the last of his savings. Then Eve mentioned she was just kidding. He didn't expect even Eve could crack jokes like that, so he said she surely has grown after going on a quest with him. Eve then scared him again by saying she would tell everyone after all, which made him lower his head on the ground to request privacy. After that, he made her promise not to tell anyone and asked her if she could make some space for him on the sitting bench which was his favorite place to have lunch every day. Eve told him to go somewhere else since she came there first, but not worrying much about it, both of them sat on the same bench on different sides of it. He was eating his lunch without any issues until the situation turned extremely awkward for him when Eve stopped reading her book. He thought it was her lunchtime so she would eat something light, judging by the size of her body. But to his surprise, she took out ten lunch boxes for herself and after praying, she started chewing down her meal quickly. Jairi was left watching her eating so much food which showed how amazing of a stomach she had. But his stares made her feel nervous as she didn't like to be stared at while eating. She told him to stop looking at her and he apologized for it. Eve again started eating her meal, and he couldn't stop himself from watching a cute small girl eating huge like that. She stopped and told him to stop looking again with a sneer, and so the bad tension between them continued for some time. Jairi still had some time left to slack off, but he decided to sit on the bench while trying to distract himself by tinkering with his magic tools. And when he put his hands inside the item box, the first magic tool came in hands were some shoes and he forgot how to maintain them. Eve noticed the shoes in his hands and asked if they were the magical tool wind boots. He admitted she was right about that, which made her quickly come closer to check the boots. Surprisingly, Eve knew how to maintain those shoes, so she told him to first insert his mana on the ankle parts first otherwise it would break. Jairi was thankful for her help and since she seemed so much, he questioned her if she also had the magic tool mania. It was basically the knowledge of all magical tools and she asked him if he had it as well. They stayed silent for a few moments and suddenly became good friends who shared one similarity of love for magical tools. Jairi asked her if she remembered when was the hero birthday festival, or if she applied to attend the artifact show. He told her how unfortunate he had been to apply in the artifact show but never gotten accepted for it because of high demands of the tickets. The hero festival was created to honor the savior of Magic Cosmea, and that hero had red hair, so on the day of the festival everyone wears red wigs to celebrate. But since he didn't get the tickets, he thought it was all over for him. Whereas Eve reached out her hand inside her bag and took out two tickets, which instantly excited Jairi. She was proud to have these two tickets, and Jairi asked her where did she get these tickets of the artifact show from. She told him that the organizer of the event was someone she knew so they gave these two tickets to her. Jairi was left with no words, and then he exclaimed that it was illegal for her to gain tickets like that, which was shameful for any magic tool enthusiast. He said he had no intention of going to the show through such means, while in reality he was begging her by kneeling his head down. She told him that his actions and words were not matching at all, but knowing that he did want to watch the show, she told him there was a way she could let him have a ticket. Jairi told her that he was willing to follow through any condition of hers for the ticket, and so she asked him to go shopping with her. He didn't expect someone serious like Eve to ask him about shopping together and made him wonder what Eve could want from him. 